Thank you. Um, when I'm not writing crime novels, I'm actually the Associate VP of Distributed Learning at UCF uh, in my spare time. And Shay is the, uh, one of our senior web application developers. So right before the session started, somebody came up here and asked us for more information about the session, trying to decide if this would be a good one for him to, um, to stay and learn about. And after we explained it to him and told him some of the things we were going to talk about, he smiled and said, yeah, I'm going to go somewhere else. <laughs> So thank you for making the choice to stay, because I hope you're going to get something out of it. So we're going to talk a little bit about LTI integration at UCF and what we're doing and why we're doing it. Very quickly, a little bit about UCF. If you don't know who we are, we're uh, the second largest university in the country now. We have about 60,000 students. We're in uh, suburban Orlando. Um, we're in R1, 216 degree programs, 11 different colleges. Uh, a whole network of uh, regional campuses around the Central Florida area, and we won the Fiesta Bowl last year, which was cool. <laughs> Online at UCF is kind of the, the student-facing um, uh, part of the university for completely online degrees and certificate programs. And actually, these numbers should be updated as of like when I got on the plane. We have 71 total um, completely online undergraduate, graduate, and graduate certificate programs. But the vast majority of our, of our online courses are actually not in degree programs. They're in just, you know, programs like general education courses and, and others. And I think that's reflected in the next slide. So we're a big school. We wouldn't be 60,000 students if we didn't have online learning because the, the campus, the physical campus infrastructure simply can't support that many students. So UCF has a, an educational access mission. And technology is one of the ways we do that. We do about 36% of our total student credit hours in online modalities every year. And about 76% of our students take at least one, usually more than one, online course every year. I have lots more stats if you want to know, but I won't share any more. So LTI strategy at UCF, why are we using LTI? One of the things we really like about Canvas, one of the things we think has been so powerful about this as a platform is the fact that it's kind of like a platform. It, it serves as the foundation of that learning stack, if you're familiar with that concept, where we can plug things into it to customize it for our own institutional context, which might be different from your institutional context. And I know through other things that Instructure is working on, they're going to take that down even more granular so that individual faculty, individual students through um, easy to use integrations can customize their own instance of Canvas even within the same course. So like if I'm using Dropbox and you're not, I can use Dropbox through an integration to upload my assignments in Canvas. So you, this customization is, is part of, I think, the power of Canvas and one of the reasons we like it so much. So customizing the experience has been one of the main reasons why we have um, really embraced LTI and, and the use of APIs. We want to make the UCF online experience unique. We think we have a lot to offer, and we want students to understand that taking an online class at UCF is going to be different than taking a, an online class at an institution down the street. Hopefully better, maybe not better, but at least different, and different is good. And then finally, and I've started this, the main reason we're we're embracing LTI is because, you know, we're a big school and we have problems, right? <laughs> Everybody's got problems. So we're trying to solve problems through the use of kind of creative technology. And we're going to share some of those with you today, what the problem was, how we're trying to address it, and maybe some of these will resonate with you, and um, maybe you have some of the same problems that we do. So the first one we'll start with is um, a library integration. You want to do, yeah, okay, so Shay's going to do a, a live demo. I'll sort of set up the, um, the, the problem. Students had to leave the learning environment to access library resources. So what, right? Well, what we wanted to do is make that much more seamless and, and integrate the library resources into the learning environment, which will make them much more ubiquitous, will make them much easier to use, and the way we did that, is by adding a library tools page within the Canvas GUI. It includes our OneSearch utility, which is like, a, like Google for our, all of our library holdings, Ask a Librarian chat, links to um, articles, research databases. 
it's not everything the library has, but in, in collaboration with the UCF library, we figured out what are the top like eight things that students want to use when they're in a course, and this is what we came up with. And you know, how many hits have we had on this? Uh, over 70,000 just in the last semester. Yeah, it's been popular, and it's student facing. So this is for students. Now the next yeah. one we're gonna show is for faculty. It's a library integration for faculty. And we can, we can just go right into that. Yep, so this is just a regular uh, Canvas uh, wiki page. So I'm gonna go right into this. And for our faculty members, we have a tool called OneSearch Lite, which just is right above here in the uh, editor button bar. So I click that. And of course, this is all online, so no problems will happen during this demo. I'm sure we have a great connection. <laughs> so this is our one search light tool. As you can see, this just pops up right into your wiki page. And one track mind, I'm gonna do a search for Raspberry Pi. And you can see you can do by keyword, author, or title. But I'm gonna do a search right here for this. So while that's searching, the problem we're trying to solve here is a, is a problem for faculty, which is I wanna put direct links into, uh, of library holdings directly into my Canvas course without having to leave the learning environment where I'm building my course to go search the library, find that static link, copy it, bring it back, and paste it into the course. So as you can see, we got 368 results coming from our uh, database, with our, from our library database. So I'm just going to insert this uh, first one here. And you can preview it if you wanted to check it out as well. So I'm gonna save changes, and I, right now I wanna say that we, I'm already logged in via Shibboleth, which is SAML. I'm logged in uh, through our single sign-on. So now when I go to click this, it's going to bring me to our easy proxy. But because I'm already signed in, I just click that once, I don't have to sign in again. It's now, they ooh, sign in. ah. Welcome to UCF authentication. <sighs> Live demos, yay. Well, the idea is that you don't have to do that. Pay no attention yeah. to the login. <laughs> See, and it'll bring you right to this. That's what I get for changing networks. And this is going to bring me to the uh, EBSCO host page with the full text. So you can then click on the full text button and it'll go through all that. I probably clicked on a, I used a bad one that doesn't show a lot of full text because this is IEEE stuff. Um, but if I go back, I can like do another one. It gives you the PDF files. It'll give you uh, the HTML full text depending on uh, uh, what the type of uh, full text article is. If it's something from a magazine, it'll give you the actual PDF of the magazine. Um, all different types. And we're constantly adding uh, our library electronics resources uh, manager is constantly adding uh, new uh, databases into our main EBSCO database. So as the semester goes on, we're adding more and more and more. The one search light is, is, is a kind of a front end of the EBSCO search and it covers what like 80 to 90 percent of the, of the library holdings. And if it's in the library through that search tool, a faculty member will find it through this tool. And if you're on the UCF network, you won't, you won't have to log in, I promise. I never have. <laughs> Only today. So I guess I changed networks. <laughs> Okay, so our next one. Uh, we have screen captures in case the internet didn't work, which never happens. Yeah. Ah, yes. So we have, we had a tool that we built years and years ago that allowed faculty. To, this was like before Facebook, that allowed faculty to get pictures of their classes, whether they're teaching face to face with some sort of a web enhancement or they're teaching online. They really wanted to know what their students looked like. And when we took this thing away, which was programmed in like, you know, this stone was, age on carved walls, it was really old code. We had to get rid of it. Some of the faculty really screamed. Like we loved the roster tool and we can't get that any other way. You can get it through PeopleSoft, but the way it displays is in a really non-user friendly way. It's like one long giant list and you would print out tens and dozens of pages um, in order to get your, your roster. So we built this tool called the roster tool. Yep, class photos, so let me just save that. So we've installed this as a user tool. So if you go into your user settings, 
class photos appears. And this is now going to pull any uh, course that you're an instructor in. So I'm going to go into our CDL roster, which is just a course full of our of CDL's employees. And what's We're doing? Not violating any FERPA rules. Yeah. Right now. So what it's doing right now is it's grabbing all of our class photos from our class ID system. And if you notice this picture not available for uh, one of our part-timers, this is actually FERPA flagged. So he doesn't want his photo to be shown. So we, uh, we, uh, I'm blanking on the word. <laughs> We're, yeah, we restrict that. We see that it's flagged and we won't show that picture. So we have our list here of all of our, uh, of all of our part-timers, our full-timers, just all of our employees with CDL. And this works for all of the courses. If you're an instructor in a course, you can pull this up and see that. Now, if a student tries to gain access to this, it'll just say they're not a teacher in any course, sorry. But Now, yeah. this was just recently completely re-architected. And so mm -hmm. I wonder if you could say a word about what we sure. did at first and then what we changed and why. OK. So, uh, a few things happen with it. One is uh, our main one was our we connect to Oracle all the time for our pictures and our FERPA information. So a lot of our hits with this, we have some really really large courses, and one of our problems was we were just hitting the uh, the database a lot, especially at the uh, st start of uh, classes, start of the semester. So we had to implement persistent connections so we can keep one connection open and just stream the photos as needed. Another thing that happened is because we have courses that are just so huge, we uh, cut them into sections. Initially, we didn't display the uh, courses by section, so now we have that ability, and that was rolled out for the last semester. If I go back to the class photos, uh, the class roster, it's going to show that in my development course, I have a couple of different uh, uh, sections in there, and then it will just pull the students that are only in that section. So it's a lot faster, a lot easier for faculty members to pull that up. Uh, yeah. I think we have a question coming up. Yeah, question. I have a question. How does that differ in how is that used different than the people section in Canvas? Is it almost still the same? The question was how is it different than the people section in Canvas? Do you want me? Okay, so very good question. We did uh, think about taking all the class photos and you get a button for the question <laughs> and putting them in and pushing them into the uh, avatar system but after a couple talks about that people were able to update those as needed and it may not be a a valid photo it may not be an official photo this these photos are at least taken from our id card system so we can validate that the person you're seeing is the person that should be at that seat but we did think about that, and we were thinking about using the API to just push all the photos right into the avatar system. One more question? Yeah. yeah. Is there a reason why you didn't place the tool in the course guide in the course kit menu to create um, instructor? Let me repeat the question. So the, the question was, is, is there a reason why we put it where we did as opposed to um, in individual courses? Not really. <laughs> We, we figured that it would be the most user-friendly place there, especially because an instructor can go and just hit back and then go to the next course. Uh, we have thought about putting it into the individual course section, especially since an LTI can only be shown to a faculty member. And that's something we're experimenting with for the next version that we roll out next semester. One thing we are really aware of, though, because we have all of these ideas about LTI integrations that we want to do, that. We want to be really protective of the real estate in the in the course navigation bar, and that library tools. We had a lot of debate: should we put a, another button there? And we've got the you do it tool, which if you were in the session previous to this next door, um, you know that's another one that's potentially going there. We're talking about doing a student success resources page that would include access to the student writing center and to advising and to some other things. Um, and should, should that go there? Because we can't have an, a, you know, a student writing center link and an advising link and all these other things. Otherwise, it just becomes way too long. So as many things as we can to move them out of that left-hand navigation bar, we're, we're looking at that. We know that at some point, maybe we'll be able to put them along the top, but right now, that, that doesn't exist. 
And one thought we have with that, uh, especially with the sidebar, is maybe grouping a bunch of the tools together as one. And it's just something as we build these out, we're experimenting with what the best user experience is. For now, the class photos seems to be doing really well on, on our uh, user settings page. And if it doesn't, we'll try and figure out where the best place for that is. In our previous version, in our, our previous LMS, we had the ability to add these things that we called action icons, which were little visual indicators of what faculty wanted students to do in a course. So it was read this, watch this, do this, here's a quiz. And when we went to Canvas, those kind of went away. And, and frankly, I wasn't really sad to see them go away because some of the graphics were really kind of dated and they were like built in the 90s and were like, time to update those, you know, with iOS interfaces and icons and things that have advanced in simplicity a lot. But man, there was such, <laughs> there were like torches and pitchforks at our offices. Where are my action icons? So we knew we had to do something to bring them back because they were really popular. And from a design standpoint, those sort of visual signposts in a course are really good for advanced organizers and helping students navigate and understand how to do things. And it just visually kind of breaks up the page. So I'll let Shay describe what we did. So actually with action icons, so we have this thing at UCF, it's called Hack Day. And once a semester, we kind of get to work on our own project and uh, try and learn something, maybe something we just don't have time to do. We can take the time and work on that. Action icons were uh, the very first LTI that we created. We want to learn more about the LTI system and how integrations can work. So a few of us went through it. We started playing with it. And action icons became our first official LTI that went into production. And we learned a ton from it. So with that being said, yeah, the graphics may be a little dated, but we kind of love this one because this was our, our first baby. These are better than they used to be. Yeah, that too. So uh, I have the Eben Upton Raspberry Pi thing, so I'm going to put uh, read this. So there's the icon for read this. I want, my, I want my students to know they better read that. So I put that in there. It embeds the graphic, hits save changes, and that's now there as an icon embedded in your course, just like that. And we... Oh, it, where did you go to get that? In the uh, so most of our LTIs are in the uh, WYSIWYG editor button. So it's just right in there. And then let's go pull all, all of our icons. So let's go back. Badges. <clears throat> so we're, we think badges are cool. Not everybody on campus agrees with this. But <laughs> we're not done. We're still fighting. We still will continue to evangelize badges. And so um, we wanted to add badges into the experience for faculty and students within Canvas. And it was also being driven by, we just did a, a big MOOC on um, blended learning called the Blend Kit, and we wanted to do um, badges as a part of that. We had experimented with previous incarnations of that MOOC. Um, and we would scrape, we called it the gradebook scraper. It would mm. scrape the gradebook to see if certain criteria were met and if you were eligible for a badge, and then it would issue you a badge. And I'll let Shay talk about the details. Yep. So Sally, we don't have a live demo for this right now because the, the courses that we're piloting with badges have actually ended, uh, have already ended. But um, this, was a, this was a very interesting problem that we had to tackle. We had two um, uh, visual design courses that were about Dreamweaver and Adobe Photoshop. They want to issue uh, these badges as their, uh, uh, as their students uh, finished uh, assignments, got good grades, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we came up with a, uh, with a system based on Mozilla Open Badges that we would have a repository for our badges. They can see their badges through an LTI. That's this achievements link on the side here. Uh, they can see when they earned it, how they earned it, what assignment they earned it for, what course they entered for, because some of them were in both courses, so they were earning uh, the same badges. And then, if need be, they can export it to any of the uh, badge systems out there that support Mozilla Open Badges. So we've been giving these out for a while now. We had, uh, I forget the numbers off the top of my head for this one, but uh, for our blended learning kit, we had over a 1,000 badges issued, and we had a lot of uh, users in that course. So it was, uh, it was really neat. Our biggest issue was, and this is something that uh, 
we're hoping it'll work with Canvas is because of our gradebook scraping, it uses a lot of API calls and a lot of um, just uh, hacky technology. One of our uh, big requests is to do something like webhooks, where if a student submits something, it can then you know, do a callback to maybe one of our own servers to let us know an event happened. Because right now, we kind of have to wait and see like every 15 minutes, hey, did this course get updated? Is this student been updated? And we've kind of noticed some growing pains as our courses got bigger. But for our pilot, it worked really well, and we got a lot of great feedback from it. And our design team made some really awesome badges, and a lot of them were based off of Saw for some reason. But they kind of look cool. <laughs> so if I can make one whiny complaint, so all Canvas people in the audience and listening out there online, um, th those API limitations have really limited the amount of, what is it, awesomeness that we can put into the course. So um, expl exploring other ways to do this through webhooks or, or other things or maybe running these things at different times of the day, off-peak hours or whatever, we're open, but um, mm -hmm. those, those API limitations are really limiting the amount of things that we feel like we can do. But I will say this, I really do kind of like pushing the limitations of what we can do with Canvas, because it finds out, oh, I better tell uh, the Canvas developers, hey, we ran into this, can we fix it, or is there some better way to get around this? Yeah. Who develops our APIs? Well, we have a team of people, like Shay and some others uh, uh, on, our, on our programming staff. <laughs> Widgets. Yes. Okay, you want to talk about widgets? Uh, well, let me just sort of set up what kind of yeah. widgets we're talking about. We've built a couple of proprietary, uh, homegrown kind of learning object developers, uh, development kits, if you will. Uh, one is something called Obo Jobo, which is just kind of a meaningless acronym that just sounds cool. It, and that allows us to build self-paced tutorial learning objects with content and assessment and practice. And then we have something called Materia, which allows you to build kind of smaller app-like games, sort of crossword puzzles and hangman games and uh, Jeopardy games and some other things. And we wanted to import those into Canvas in an integrated way so that performance data could be written back to the gradebook and faculty adoption went way up when we were able, when we were able to do that. So just really quickly, Materia and Obajobo, these were some of our first production uh, widgets that use course, grade, uh, course pass back, yeah, grade pass back in our courses. And really what it is, it allows a single sign-on from, uh, from Canvas into our Materia or Obojobo systems. Uh, you can take your quizzes or your learning object, uh, I guess you can play the games, and then your score will get passed back into your gradebook. And you do this all from the create and assignment uh, um, module. This just jumped in. Yeah. All right, so the last one we'll show you. We have more to show, but we're running out of time. But this one's the best one. <laughs> so this one's, this one's still cooking. It's kind of like batter in the oven. It's not quite baked yet, but we, we just had to talk about it because I think it's cool. We know that, um, that regional accreditors are going to, at some point, raise the threshold of authentication. Everybody's concerned about cheating online, although we know the stats say that there's no more incidents of cheating online than there is face-to-face. -face, but there's, a, there's that perception out there that I, I still get asked. Don't they cheat more online? We're a big school, and with all love and respect to our vendor friends who have proctoring solutions, which are really cool, we can't afford to buy them for the volume of students that go through our courses. And we're really, as much as we want to put that kind of a solution in place, we, we don't feel good about putting all of those costs on the backs of the students. You know, at maybe $25 per exam, per student, and our students are taking a lot of online classes. This could be hundreds of dollars a semester extra to them. So what we thought is, okay, we've got some smart people. Canvas is kind of cool. Everybody's got a webcam. Maybe we can build our own. So we're in the process of building a passive remote proctoring video solution. And I'll let Shay describe how that works. Okay, so really quick, um, you add the proctoring uh, system to one of your already created courses. It's another LTI. We're doing a lot of our own custom JavaScript to pull this, a lot of jQuery, a lot of our own uh, custom little widgets. And when a faculty member says that they want to make this uh, exam or quiz or assignment a proctored exam, when our system will see that, when a student then goes to take it, they're going to uh, see a page like this. This is just the normal uh, quiz page. They're gonna hit start 
this exam, and a webcam, uh, their webcam is going to launch uh, using either Flash or HTML5. We hope HTML5, since they sh should be using a modern browser. And it's going to start recording them as they're taking this exam. So this is not a live proctored exam. It's just going to be kind of a back-end system where uh, if there is any kind of thought that maybe some cheating happened, our faculty members can go uh, uh, back and they can go into our exam admin uh, LTI tool and they can see the recorded version. As you can see, that's me with somebody helping me cheat in the background. <laughs> so they the, way it, the way it works is very cool. Um, Shay's designed it so it takes a photograph every three seconds of what you're doing and then it stitches it together into a little movie and so that if, if shenanigans are suspected and <laughs> usually we are called when there are shenanigans being suspected, faculty can go back and, and review the tape and see um, did something really happen. And it's also kind of putting students on notice that you know it's the cop on the street corner. I am being observed while I take this. It, it won't eliminate all cheating. It will help us authenticate because we'll have the ID, show your ID and smile at the camera. And it will um, hopefully eliminate sort of spontaneous panic cheating. We have only like two minutes left, so I'm going to go ahead and break for questions. I see your hand is raised. Is the video taping we're doing for exams connected to Lockdown Browser? In this case, no. We have, um, we have Lockdown Browser in one lab on campus for one college, and that's a completely controlled environment. It's kind of separate from this is for anybody. And this, like I said, it's not done yet. We're still building it. Right, right. Icons. Yeah. yeah. Do the they, icons end up in the image picker? They do not end up in the image picker because it comes out as a third party image. So those images are actually hosted on our LTI server. It does clone from course to course, though. All the way in the back. You should be able to get a timestamp from that. I don't, I'm I, going to yeah. say yes, but I don't know off the top of my head. I would assume yes, because when you get the event, you should be able to grab the timestamp from that event happening anyway. Obo Jobo captures that data. I don't know if we're passing that back, but if you want to talk about financial aid reporting, I'm in the middle of that right now. That's a whole <laughs> separate topic. Um, one more question. Is, do we have time? Maybe two more? Right here. Yes. Uh, Do we still use the uh, LTI credentials through SAML? So we're not using the LTI credentials. We're using our uh, uh, Canvas credentials. So with SAML, we're going right from uh, the Canvas login. You can actually log into the library first and then go to Web Courses or Canvas, and you'll be logged in. So we're using that single sign-on. So it has nothing to do with the LTI itself. One more question, Jeff? We'll, we'll hang out if anybody wants yeah. to come up and talk. Yeah, just really quick with the gray book. It's when you have a course that's you know over 100, over 200 people, and it takes a couple milliseconds each time to get a result back from the API, those add up very quickly. And that's basically our uh, issue with that. Are we done? We're over? All right, thank you all very much. We appreciate thank it. Thank you.